Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. We'll wait for a moment for attending Evil to join us. Thank you so much. Hi, attending Evil. It's nice to see you. Thank you. How are you today, Iris? And how's um, everything? Everything is good. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining the Law Office of Edwin Newville for another webinar. For today's webinar, we will be discussing the updates to the public charge rule and immigrants' eligibility for public benefits during COVID-19. And we will also highlight specific documentation or evidence that an immigrant needs to maintain to establish that these benefits were received as a result of the COVID-19 challenges. My name is Iris Annan, a case manager at the Law Office of Edward Newville, and I will be the facilitator today. The Law Office of Edward Newville has been operating for the past 16 years in the United States, and we represent clients overseas as well. The firm handles matters pertaining to U.S. immigration law with focus on immigration fraud, terrorism, and security-related immigration issues, family and business immigration, workforce enforcement compliance, waivers of inadmissibility, immigration consequences of criminal convictions, and citizenship. The speaker for today is no other than the founder and managing attorney of the firm. Attorney Newell graduated from Washington and Lee University School of Law. He is an experienced trial lawyer, skilled negotiator, and passionate about immigration law. He is a frequent speaker at immigration legal conferences, and he is sought after by other immigration attorneys to advise and provide his opinion on the ever-changing immigration law. At the end of my dialogue with Attorney Newell, we will have a 15 to 20 minutes question and answer session. Kindly use the question and answer tab to send your questions across as the discussions are ongoing. As necessary, we have other staff members on the webinar fluent in Spanish, French, and Swahili. Please feel free to message them. If at the end of this webinar you have any follow-up questions, please call our office at 301-562-7995. You can also send an email to contact at newvolaw.com. We understand that these are challenging times financially, especially to the immigrant community. And we've had a number of people calling, inquiring about access to these public benefits and any impact it might have on any application currently pending or future applications. Today's webinar on the public charge promises to be very informative and we are happy that you could join us. Again, please do not forget to send your questions across as the discussions are ongoing. Asini Nuevo, it's a pleasure to have you on yet another webinar. Thank you very much. Um, um, it is a pleasure to be here. I think um, this will be our third or fourth uh, session uh, that we've had. And so um, I look forward uh, to yet another a fruitful fruitful talk regarding the public uh, charge and also uh, how this uh, rule has changed since 1999 up to this year and how it has you know uh, changed even we've been the last uh, two to three uh, well, I mean, last two to uh, last two to three uh, who, uh, who weeks or so. So, thank you again for joining us, and um, you know, I hope uh, that you have a chance, uh, you know, to learn from this webinar. So, at this time, uh, please, uh, you know, begin with okay. the dialogue. Again. Thank you, Attorney. I'll have all my questions prepared for you. And um, the obvious questions to begin with is, what is public charge? Okay, so the public charge, uh, we've heard a lot about the public charge. Uh, the public charge is a rule um, that serves uh, to regulate uh, those who are coming into the United States uh, to seek residence. And so this rule is found uh, within the statute, is uh, section 212, I mean, uh, I mean um, it's section uh, 212, 
paid for. And basically what it says is that for anybody who's seeking to come into the United States, uh, they have to prove that uh, they are not likely to become a public charge. And what that means is that once you enter the United States and once you're coming in, either whether you are applying uh, here in the U.S. or whether you're applying uh, from outside, um, you are attesting that once you enter, that you have the skills, you have the resources to support yourself and that you won't be asking the federal or the state you know, for help. And so uh, for those who are applying, you know, in addition to other grounds that they have to meet regarding whether or not uh, they have arrested, uh, one of the things is whether or not you will become a future public charge. Um, and there's a process in which uh, that one would submit documentation uh, mm -hmm. to verify that. Okay, so how does the government determine that somebody is inadmissible, inadmissible, sorry. How does the public charge ground, how is it triggered? Okay, well, I mean, in generally, um, everybody is subject to that, it's especially when you're applying for adjustment of status mm -hmm. through a family base, okay? Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, there are several uh, criteria uh, that one has to prove that those grounds don't apply to you. So automatically, um, it is assumed that these grounds apply to you unless you can prove they do not. Otherwise. So uh, in the context of the public charge, the person who is applying for you, the sponsor, has to submit uh, a form I-864. Uh, and that form basically says that they are in a position, they have work, that they are able to support you should you fall on hard times. Um, in 1999, this law came, uh, this law started. Uh, and under the law in 1999, uh, things that one will look at is whether or not uh, the non citizen has access to health care, uh, whether they have received any kind of uh, public assistance uh, for housing. And those were kind of the general things that if, if a non-citizen or a person who was applying for adjustment of status uh, ever applied for, those would bear on uh, whether or not the public charge will apply. Mm -hmm. um, as of August 2019, as we, you know, the reason why we're here also is that the, uh, there was a new law proposed. And this law came into effect uh, February 24th, 2020, which in addition to what the 1999 law um, um, stated, uh, mm -hmm. required additional or included additional uh, things that were, uh, that one, if one were to apply for, would prevent them um, uh, from obtaining uh, their permanent residence uh, status. And this is in addition to the I-864. Right. <laughs> There's a form also called the form I-944, which is the um, self, uh, self-sufficiency proof where the applicant has to fill out. And there's a whole list of criteria, uh, including your age, your health, your educational status, the, uh, your proficiency um, in a language, and those things, debts. Uh, those are the things now that with the new law, um, the, uh, the government now looks at those things in the totality of the circumstances, plus uh, what the sponsor submits in the Form I-864. Okay, so um, in addition to the August 2019 new definition that the um, Department of Homeland Security gave to the public charge rule. Has there been any updates from the Trump administration pertaining to this rule? Okay, well, when the, when, when the rule was first uh, proposed, of course, uh, a lot of advocates uh, saw it and mm -hmm. immediately uh, decided, you know, to uh, immediately decided to challenge this rule. And from August 2019 up until 
I would say last week, there have been a lot of lawsuits. Uh, and of course, there was a point of time where uh, there, was, there was a lawsuits that came out. Um, and after the rule came in effect in February 2000, uh, um, in February 24th, there was a, a lawsuit filed. Um, and that basically stopped uh, USCIS uh, from, uh, from carrying along uh, with the new rule. Now, uh, as recently as August 12th, uh, there has been uh, an updated development in the series of lawsuits that basically says that, okay, the government has the right to move forward with the implementation of this new rule and the form I-944. But the court decision also made a narrow exception for three states within the Second Circuit, which was New York, Connecticut, and Vermont. So those living in those th uh, three states do not yet have to, um, uh, do not yet have to abide with the uh, new regulations, um, mm -hmm. but they will be subjected to the 1999 law, but everybody else is subjected to that. Um, another interesting uh, point to make is that mm -hmm. when all these lawsuits were ongoing and uh, the uh, judge uh, basically told DHS to stop and not to carry on with this new uh, provision, the forms were taken off the website uh, right. and instructions were provided that applicants should not submit the I-944 application mm -hmm. form. Um, but with this new development, of course, it's been only what, six days since uh, that last um, decision. Uh, the website has not yet been changed. And of course, USCIS has not provided us with any new guidelines. Okay. So with the exception of Vermont, Connecticut, and New York, any other applicants outside these three states must submit the I-944, correct? The, oh, that's correct. Um, What's the name? What's the form? Um, Declaration of Self-Sufficiency, correct? Oh, that's correct. Okay. Yes. So, um, <laughs> great. So, I was trying to remember Declaration of Self-Sufficiency. Okay, that's great. Now, um, so who does this latest public charge rule apply to? Well, it applies um, to those who are seeking, to, uh, those who are applying for permanent uh, status. Um, and really, um, those, uh, those, uh, those would be folks who are applying um, through their families. Mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, those who are applying to change their status. So let's say if you're in one category, like an H-1B, and you're changing uh, to an L visa, those, uh, those questions are also required. Uh, and you also have to prove you know, self-sufficiency. But in this context, you know, what we have is a lot of individuals who are applying uh, for permanent residency uh, status based on family relations. Um, and remember that uh, anybody or any applicant can, 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 uh, can't where uh, one has to submit uh, the affidavit of support or one who is subjected to the public charge rule uh, will be impacted with this I-944. Right, okay. So aside the person's adjusting status, are there any specific exemptions? Are there, you know, classification of people that are particularly exempted from the public charge rule? Correct. Um, those who have obtained refugee or those who have asylee uh, status and are now in the process of adjusting, meaning those who are in the process of filing their green cards based on their refugee status, those, the public charge rule do not apply to them. Mm -hmm. uh, those who also, uh, and, uh, who have the uh, U and T visas, um, of course, um, those who have uh, TPS, uh, the public charge rule don't apply you know, to those applicants. Um, and so, you know, those are just kind of like the, some, I mean, those are the uh, uh, key persons uh, who uh, this rule will not, uh, the, who, uh, you know, who this rule will not, uh, who this rule will not, I mean, in effect. Um, also, uh, most recently with the 
L R I, I mean, uh, uh, of F. Um, the um, provisions provide that uh, they are also not subjected to the uh, public charge rule. Okay, speaking about the LRIF, we did have a webinar a month ago and we highlighted the eligibility for the LRIF, that is the Liberian Refugee Immigration Fairness Act. Right. We have that webinar available and a colleague will be sharing the link on the, on the chat. Thank you so much. Attorney Nuvo, mm -hmm. so how is this public charge rule applied? How does it apply? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll give you, well, I'll start up by just talking uh, the rule prior to 2020. So in 1999, you know, uh, the basic process uh, for the public charge is that your sponsor will submit uh, the I-864. That's the affidavit of support saying that um, they bear responsibility for you. Uh, and they're ensuring that, you know, should you fall on hard times that you have the financial resources to support them. Um, and you have, you know, the sponsor will present his taxes, uh, proof of employment. And even if your sponsor doesn't have enough funds or uh, then you can also get a joint sponsor. Now, what the new rule did was that in addition to that, was that they now require this form, this I-944 self-sufficiency form, which goes deeper into inquiring into the applicant's history, into the applicant's household. Has anyone received any public assistance um, you know, within the last three years? Have anyone, uh, you know, what's your uh, debts? Uh, what's your language uh, proficiency uh, in terms of health? Uh, you know, those are the kind of prime things now that this form goes into uh, in inquiring. Um, there's not one uh, answer that one can give that will derail this whole process in the I-944. Uh, what the government and what the officer is supposed to do is the officer is supposed to look at the totality of the circumstances and determine what is the future like likelihood that you would become a public charge. And once that is done to also compare that with the form I-864, the affidavit of support. And so now you have, you know, a lot more questions. Um, the categories and the programs uh, that are covered um, have extended uh, more uh, than what we had uh, prior to this new rule. And so you're caught into a situation now um, in, you know, you're almost applying for a loan or a mortgage almost based on the questions and the information that one will have to submit and provide in this form. So it's extensive. Uh, the forms uh, itself is long, um, but it also, you know, gave a lot of flexibility to the officer in determining what is the what is the totality of the circumstances, and weighing the positives and the negative factors. Okay, and um, can you kindly highlight some of the specific public benefits that we are talking about here? Okay, so uh, if you receive uh, cash assistance, so mm -hmm. SSI, um, you have uh, food stamps or what people call SNAP, uh, federal public housing or or as you refer to section eight, uh, state or local cash assistance um, and things like so. It kind of gives you an idea as to what, you know, how this could impact you. Um, now, there's a other list of other things that will not be classified as public benefits, such as the uh, children's health insurance program, uh, food banks, uh, tax credits, uh, health and nutrition services. Also, if you're a member of, you know, the army or, you know, or a member of their service or your family, um, uh, those who are a service, uh, those who are service, uh, service uh, members are not impacted uh, with this uh, public charge rule. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Neville. Let me remind our audience that please send your questions across as the discussions are ongoing. You can use the question and answer tab on the screen. Thank you again for joining us. Um, Attorney Nero, 
So there has been a second circuit court of appeals decision on, I believe that was August 12, 2020, about this public charge. Can you um, explain a bit on that, please? Okay, well, it all started, um, you know, basically uh, when this rule was passed, a lot of nonprofits, uh, uh, you know, came out and uh, filed a lawsuit for, uh, uh, challenging uh, this uh, new public child charge rule. Mm -hmm. uh, and when the lawsuit was filed, these organizations also asked the judge to stop uh, uh, USCIS from carrying on with this uh, new rule. And so for a time, you know, that process was stopped. Uh, in addition, with the whole pandemic and the virus, uh, that was also grounds to kind of pause any, um, you know, any, um, of, uh, you know uh, starting up with this uh, new rule. Um, what is important now is that, you know, you had a series of rulings in the Second Circuit, mm -hmm. in the Fourth Circuit, basically stopping uh, DHS from moving forward with this case. In the last, I would say, at least four weeks or so, both the Fourth Circuit has said um, the Department of Homeland Security can move forward. And also the Second Circuit has uh, come out and say, okay, well, uh, the government can move forward with their, uh, uh, this form, all except those states that we have jurisdiction over. And so basically, uh, now the posture that we're in is kind of in a waiting game because uh, when the government was stopped, uh, a guidance was given up saying that, you know, basically you don't have to submit these applications anymore. The forms were taken down from the website. Now we have this new ruling in the last uh, six days that basically said, you know, they can move forward with it. Um, and so the, the position that most attorneys and applicants find themselves in is that, well, if you're filing for a green card uh, now, you know, it would be more, it would be prudent to submit uh, this form I-944, unless you live in those three states. But one problem you run into is, you know, if you're downloading the form from the website, those forms have been taken off. And so if you have to submit your application before the fees go up in about a month, right. um, you know, will the government come back and say, okay, you know, uh, you know, please submit these forms? Or will they go by the long standing, uh, the long standing um, pro policy of saying that because you don't, you did not re, uh, submit this relevant form, uh, your application will be denied. So these are things that we as attorneys um, are grappling with and trying to figure out what is the prudent way to move forward on applications, you know, that that are ready uh, to be filed and move forward. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry about that. So um, before COVID-19 pandemic and everything surrounding COVID-19, the public charge in admissibility and admissibility rules existed before COVID-19. Right. Now we have some people who, as a result of the COVID-19, were forced to take some assistance. Mm -hmm. How do they show that it was as a result of the COVID-19? Okay. So, and, and this is a question that, of course, how a lot of my clients uh, and folks have also asked me and reached out to mm -hmm. me regarding uh, the help that they need during this pandemic. And it's okay. real. Individuals have lost their jobs, their livelihood, and there's a need for assistance. And so um, how do you balance the need to take care of your family uh, against the possibility down the line of how this will affect your green card? Luckily, USCIS um, provided some guidance that says that if uh, you're seeking benefits directly related to this COVID-19 and which are the result of the COVID-19, it wouldn't affect, it wouldn't apply to the public charge rule, but you have to document and prove that there, that there exists this exemption. And so, uh, the question now is, well, what are they looking for? What is relevant? And what do you provide to show that you are directly impacted uh, as a result of this, um, 
uh, health pandemic, uh, you know, the guidance you know, that I will provide is that you want to document and keep a record of everything. So if you've lost your job and as a result of losing your job, or if your hours have reduced and as a result you need assistance, then you need to document one, when did you lose your job? When did the, the event that triggered your need to seek um, federal assistance or state or local assistance come into place? Um, and you document that. If you have an application that you submit, uh -huh. keep a copy of that application. And as well, I will say keep an ongoing tab of your financial needs and, you know, and your financial needs uh, that have resulted as a result of this pandemic. The more documentation, the more uh, details you have, the more likely you're able to show that you weren't just asking for, uh, you know, for assistance, uh, just to ask. Um, of course, I would also say if the events or if your situation was as such before this pandemic, Mm. And you apply and you're saying that because of the pandemic and you're relying on things that happened before this pandemic happened, you may have an uphill battle. Right. So the best thing to do is maintain proper records. Evidence is key here, correct? Correct. Okay. So um, someone who takes preventive care or has obtained some care as a result of the COVID-19 does it affect any application pending? Does it have any effect on the public charge rule? No, not at all. And, uh, and USCIS has made it clear that, you know, pub and testing uh, related to the COVID-19, the pandemic, uh, will not uh, count against you uh, regarding the public charge. Okay, great. Um, let me look at some of the questions that we have received from our audience, then we come back to our discussions at any level. Okay. okay. So I have a question here. So does the public charge test only apply to persons adjusting status in the USA, or does it include possible immigrants who have an approved I-130 and undergoing consular processing? So the public charge rule applies to both those who are processing the green cards in the US as well as those who are outside. Um, the public charge rule before 2020 uh, also applied to both uh, those who are in the U.S. and those who are applying outside. Specifically, the form I-944 applies to those who are in the U.S. And ironically, well, or ironically, but uh, on February 24th, uh, when the public charge rule came into effect, the State Department also issued their similar version of a form uh, that mirrors the I-944 that applicants will have you know, to use when they are processing um, uh, from overseas. Now the, now, the lawsuits that were filed also impacted both the, those in the U.S. and those outside of the U.S. Mm -hmm. regarding the processing or the use of the new public charge rules. Of course, with this uh, August 12th, you know, ruling both USCIS uh, uh, and the Department of State would then have to go back to the drawing board mm -hmm. and kind of take a look to see how these things would be impacted. At least from our experience, when we are submit, when we have submitted ongoing applications, um, even you know, since February 2004 or so, uh, we haven't had any questions or any kickbacks from uh, the National Visa Center or the consulates. Any with any advisals of needing, I think the form is a DS five four four zero. So needing to to have the applicants submit that form. But I am um, I have my eyes open, and I expect that um, mm -hmm. at some point uh, we will be getting some form of information or request uh, that these forms may be necessary. So to answer your question in short, okay. yes, it apply outside and inside. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. We have another question from the audience. So um, an audience is currently in removal proceedings mm -hmm. and wondering if taking any public benefits affects um, his proceedings. Well, uh, that's a broad question. It depends on uh, mm -hmm. what public benefits um, are you receiving? When did you receive it? 
um, mm -hmm. as well. So I will answer the, the uh, question as though uh, the person has a family-based adjustment of, of status, meaning that they're applying through their spouse or a family member and they're in removal proceedings. So the public charge, again, it's always, um, um, has always existed since 1999. Um, so yes, your sponsor will need to submit an affidavit of support. Now, for those individuals who have worked in the US uh, for more than 10 years or so, uh, there used to be a form where you would submit where you won't be subjected to the public charge rule. Uh, that form has been removed and the questions are have been subsumed into the affidavit of support and to the I-944. Most importantly is that the I-944 only applies to USCIS and not those who are in removal proceedings. Um, in the comments when the rule was uh, first proposed and those had to make comments, uh, it was made clear that the form I-944 uh, do not apply in removal proceedings. And so as of now, until the, until the Department of Justice uh, creates a similar form uh, that could be used in removal proceedings, applicants in removal proceedings, yes, are still subjected to the public charge, but in submitting the I-944, it's not required. Okay, so you're not required to file the I-944 when you are in removal proceedings, but it may go, the court may consider that in making a determination, am I correct? Correct, correct, correct. The court may, okay. and I think there are questions on uh, the application that one may leave uh, mm -hmm. to asking whether or not you've received any, um, uh, any kind of assistance or so. Uh, so those other questions are on the I-864 and also on uh, the application for adjustment of status. Um, right, and also to go back on your earlier point, if you did take these benefits as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, then you should keep proper records. Correct, correct, correct. Okay. and very much so. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing I will point out also is that uh, keep in mind and notate when did you receive these public assistance? Mm -hmm. uh, was it before uh, February 2024, uh, 2020, or was it after? Uh, did you receive it before and after February 2020? You had to renew it. These are important questions that you would need to bring out to the attention of your attorney uh, in deciding uh, how this public charge will, uh, how this public charge will affect you. Um, another thing also is that there are there are individuals like uh, those who have TPS that are not subjected to the public charge. Those with temporary protected status can apply for these public, uh, uh, public assistance. But let's say they have the opportunity now to obtain lawful permanent residence uh, through a category where the public charge uh, will become an issue. Then that's something that needs to be looked at and to discuss again, when did you receive the public charge? Uh, and was it after February 2020 um, mm -hmm. as well? Our next question, let's see what we have from our audience. So, if a person at a level was previously exempt from the public charge and they did receive some public benefits, would that be counted later if the person seeks to adjust status in the, in the future? Correct. And um, I will say um, yes. And the reason why I say yes, uh, there, there's a lot of if, and, and buts. But yes, because let's say you are a recipient of TPS, mm -hmm. Temporary Protective Status, right. uh, and uh, you obtain um, a food stamps, a public, uh, you know, um, in assistance. Uh, when you uh, uh, go through the process of adjusting status, mm -hmm. and if it's in a category where the public mm -hmm. charge rule applies, then yes, you will then be subjected to the public charge rule. And of course, this declaration of self-sufficiency comes into effect. So yes, that's something that one should be aware of. Um, also, 
uh, you have those who have obtained status um, as refugees or those who have obtained status um, as asylum. Once in a while, they may say, you know what, I want to apply for my green card, not based on my status, but based on uh, my marriage to a U.S. citizen. That's an option. The public charge rule and other things will kick in as well. So the answer is yes. If you have been exempted before from the public charge rule, uh, will it impact you in the uh, future? Yes, no. But that's something that you will need to bring to the attention of your attorney um, mm -hmm. as you go through this process. Okay. And uh, thank you, Attorney. And you mentioned that you need to submit the form I-864, that is the affidavit of support. Then you submit the form I-944 declaration of self-sufficiency. Right. So if you submit these documents to the government or the United States Citizenship and Immigration Service, do they weigh the positive and the negative, you know, positive factors before making a decision or they just look at the negatives? Well, the way they look at it in the totality of the circumstances. So basically right. everything mm -hmm. comes together. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there's a whole list uh, that they look at. They look at your age, uh, mm -hmm. they look at your health, uh, your, pro uh, your, um, your proficiency, uh, your background. Do you have a bachelor's degree? Do you have a um, high school? Uh, you look at your health. Um, all those things are considered when they're looking at your self-sufficiency or your ability uh, or likelihood to be a public charge or not to be a public charge. Uh, there's not one single point uh, that weighs, that outweighs, you know, the other. But of course, if you have uh, more factors that weigh against the likelihood of you uh, not becoming a public charge, then that's an issue that, you know, one will then have, you know, to look at. Right. I think you, how do you suppose the government will treat pandemic unemployment insurance? Um, and so is, uh, so it's like those who are, I mean, those who have a work permit, mm -hmm. those who are working lawfully, and as a result of the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, have to apply for insurance benefits. Again, on the covering of COVID-19, mm -hmm. that will be a public charge. Um, you know, um, as well, even though, you know, even as you, even though you're a worker also, mm -hmm. and you're coming into that insurance, you know, as well, that is something that is the result of your uh, ability to work in the United States, but specifically to the COVID-19 pandemic, as we stated before, um, those will not, even, uh, those will not, uh, those will not affect um, your uh, um, uh, status. Uh, I think hold on. Okay, great. I think you vote. So um, you mentioned that refugees are exempted from the public charge rule. So a refugee in that in that instance is free to, you know, access state or federal any state or federal benefits. Is that correct? Correct. Refugees and asylees um, have the right by virtue of their status to get uh, certain types of federal and state assistance uh, and that is provided to them by law. So yes, if you're an asylee, in fact, when you're granted your refugee and your uh, status, uh, those provisions uh, are explained to you either um, by USCIS or uh, your attorney uh, should um, uh, tell you uh, what public I mean, assistance are also, uh, you know, provided. Okay, so just to, you know, touch it a bit. So are we saying that these are persons who have received a determination as asylees or refugees, or what if I am yet to submit an application or I have an application pending and I have not been invited for interview? Okay, so if you're an applicant for a ref, uh, I mean, so if you're an applicant um, and you have a pending um, asylum status, either with mm -hmm. CIS or before the judge, mm -hmm. then the question is, I mean, you still should be mindful mm -hmm. of 
the fact that this could impact you if you decide to apply uh, to adjust your status mm -hmm. in a category where the public charge um, uh, comes up. But if you're going through the normal uh, process and you are an applicant, um, it will not impact your application for asylum. As long as, when, you know, as, long, you know, as when you applied uh, for those assistance, you represented your true status, uh, you know, and all those things. Because once you're granted, mm -hmm. once you're able to, uh, to obtain your asylum uh, status, you mm -hmm. will have access to those benefits. Right, okay. So even if you, you did take those benefits, I mean, you've always touched on just keep records to show that these benefits were taken during the COVID-19 and if you are a refugee, you are exempted, but that nothing beats keeping records, correct? No, no. <laughs> exactly, okay. You must, I always say that. It's always good. I always advise to keep records <laughs> all times. You always want to document mm -hmm. and keep records. Right, okay. And I tell you, when does the public charge ground of deportability apply? Uh, the public charge ground of deport, uh, deportability, uh, mm -hmm. there's a ground uh, that if it's found that you are uh, subjected to the public charge or you are a public charge, you can be deported. It's not, it's rarely, uh, it's a situation, I haven't, in my 15 years of practice, I haven't seen anyone put into removal proceedings uh, because they have access public, uh, I mean, because they have access of public assistance. Now, uh, case law have said that uh, in order for them, for that to be triggered, in order for you to be placed in removal proceeding, uh, the entity has to, you know, first request uh, that you reimburse them for whatever, uh, uh, for whatever, for what, uh, for what assistance, you know, you receive, um, mm -hmm. that you also, you know, refuse, you know, to pay. Um, and then before that goes into the next uh, uh, steps. But it's something that is very rarely applied. Right. And even before they get to that, um, mm -hmm. the entity can also contact the, the uh, sponsor uh, mm -hmm. for payment. And also if the applicant is found and finds themselves destitute or needing help, the applicant can also request uh, support from the sponsor. So there's a lot of steps, things that goes into it. Is involved uh, before that is triggered. I haven't mm -hmm. seen anyone put into removal proceedings because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, we're in a new times and in a new mm -hmm. administration. So, um, you know, just to say it does exist. And so uh, be mindful of that. Right. Okay. Thank you, Tanya. So, um, I'll just pause with the questions from the audience and then I'll go back with, to our discussions. So um, if the person has applied for public benefits before the implementation of the new rule, what would you advise that they do? Well, if they apply before the new rule, uh, USCIS guidance and also the rules have said that um, it's, you know, it's February 24th going forward. Mm -hmm. But also to be reminded that um, you know, even if you applied or received it in November or December of 2019, at a certain point, you may have to renew it. Some, in, for some states or some programs, is maybe every six months or so. Well, then the question becomes, well, do I then go back to renew uh, for my food stamps benefits or for my federal assistance after, after February 24th? Uh, what, are, what type of advice do you need? Um, mm -hmm. Is it only that they're looking at that I was approved before February 24th, or is it that I got reapproved and received additional uh, you know, assistance in um, you know, June of 2020? Those are questions that I would say there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, a lot um, of interpretation there. Mm -hmm. And one would need to sit and speak with their lawyer uh, to devise a strategy, a strategy, you know, in moving forward. And okay. remembering, remembering also 
that the I-944 is the totality of the circumstances uh, that's involved. And so uh, this may be one point that pops up, but you may have several other positives in that maybe you're in the process of obtaining um, profici um, proficiency, you're in the process of obtaining a degree, you have a work lineup, you know, all these things. So it's really that calls for you to sit and talk with the attorney uh, on um, what is feasible. Right, so it's always best to speak with an attorney for the attorney to advise you. If you already have an application pending or if you do have an application that you intend to submit either for yourself or for um, a relative, it's good to speak with an attorney before you proceed. Senior, you probably might have answered this question already, but I believe naturalization applicants are not subject to the public charge rule, correct? No, not at all. They are not uh, subjected to the uh, public uh, charge rule. The public charge rule applies to those who are obtaining permanent resident status in the United States. Okay. In the same vein, if you are a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident applying for a relative, it applies to you as a to the beneficiary and not to the petitioner. Correct. 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 So that is subjected. They're only subjected to um, uh, just the applicant, the non-citizen. Uh, but of course, if you are uh, seeking federal assistance, mm -hmm. uh, the question comes up. Do you have the necessary resources then to sponsor someone to come into the U.S.? So, okay. Because um, on the form I-944, you are required to list um, the beneficiary's name and if there's any household member. Mm -hmm. So the petitioner is the household member of the beneficiary. Correct. And then if you've taken any benefits, it goes both ways. Correct. So then it would mean that if the petitioner is unable to cater for the beneficiary. Won't that bring up any issues? Of course, it would bring up you know that issue because if the sponsor, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you know, is filing an and I is sixty four, but then mm -hmm. when they look on the declaration of self sufficiency, you know, mm -hmm. either they have a lot a uh, long history of debt, maybe, or that they have. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, or they have applied uh, for federal, mm -hmm. uh, for federal, I mean, for federal, uh, for federal, I mean, for federal I mean, assistance, then that mm -hmm. will, of course, cause into question um, whether or not they can really um, provide support to the applicant if and when that comes up. That may not be an issue, but. So the most important thing here is, although Attorney Nuevo has indicated that the Form I-944, that is a declaration of self-sufficiency, applies to the beneficiary, there are some experts that apply to the petitioner and it's important to seek legal advice, especially if you have filed an application for a beneficiary. Correct, correct. Because, uh, and I also wanna note that even with the application, uh, with the I-860, Four, um, um, you know, there are times where uh, the, 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 the applicant's uh, salary and resources can be also be used uh, in the I-864, uh, provided that they can prove that they have a job and that they will continue with that job uh, throughout the uh, process. So long story short, uh, you know, this area is complicated. It's a lot of mm -hmm. if and buts and movements. Uh, this is just a summary of things you'd be aware of, but it's always prudent to seek the advice and input of an attorney in this process. Okay, and this question might be a bit interesting. So we are speaking to our people who are accessing public benefits because they are financially unable to you know cater for themselves or their family because of this pandemic and then we are asking them to seek legal advice what if they can't afford legal advice or to hire an attorney 
Well, there's a lot of, there's several uh, nonprofits that are, you know, involved in this area, uh, you know, wherever you are, that are ready to speak with you. They're ready to assist you. And don't forget, I mean, a consultation also, you know, is the first step, step in figuring out what are your options and what you can do. What you do after you get uh, that is, you know, you, you, know, you can you decide to go to a nonprofit, you can decide to file yourself. But the most important thing is understanding what you know and what you don't know and deciding whether or not you want to take that risk of, of proceeding in an area that is extremely complex. If you don't have money, there's nonprofits, there are Catholic charities, there's clinic, there's other uh, nonprofits around the U.S. that are capable uh, in working with you in navigating this process. Okay. If you have any follow-up questions, please call our office at 301-562-7995 or email us at contact at newvolaw.com. That is contact at newvolaw.com. I tell you to wrap it up. Do you have any last words for our audience? Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us on our third webinar. Thank you also for your patience as we navigated to this minor technical glitch. But mm -hmm. as always, the most important thing is being I, I mean, is to, I mean, is to have a plan B and to be ready, you know, to adapt. So, you know, it's been a pleasure also, and I look forward to seeing you all on our next webinar. We'll let you know about that. Uh, and it's been a pleasure always. I enjoyed uh, sharing my knowledge uh, and speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. We are happy that you took time off your busy schedules to join us. Again, we have made resources available and my colleague will share that in the chat session. Thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you on our next webinar. Thank you so much.